Good morning and welcome to another Rose Red Homestead class, RRH class. And this time we're going to be working on sprouting wheat for flour and bread. Our goal in all of this is to develop simple and standardized recipe and methods that produces a beautiful loaf of bread that tastes fantastic and carries excellent nutrition. What we did not want to produce was a squatty, flat loaf, very dense, loaded with seeds, as if it were important to carry the entire day's worth of nutrition in a single slice. We are after a regular looking loaf of bread that is lovely and appetizing and um, also carries some versatility with it. So if we wanted to adjust and put other things within the dough, we could certainly do that. This class is just a little bit different. It is going to be a series of video clips because it took place over several days. So let's get started. Here's what you will learn in the class today. You will learn a method for sprouting that is very, very different from most of what you see online. And it has these three steps. It is the details of these steps that are really, really important. And for that, you're going to need a handout. I'll talk about that in just a minute. You're also going to learn a, a bread method, a dough handling method that is a compilation of what I know about making artisan bread plus what I learned about handling dough that uses sprouted flour. So um, I strongly urge you to go to our website right now and download this handout. It's a two-page handout, and it goes into some of the details, but you're going to want to probably have a pencil or a pen handy so that you can make margin notes or notes in a separate notebook as you go along. As you know, our Rose Red Homestead classes last a little bit longer than our traditional videos, uh, probably about an hour, um, and at the end of this, we will have nailed these two methods, plus produced some loaves of bread that um, are a perfect picture of exactly what our goal was. Beautiful, taste great, and carry great nutrition. With that, let's go ahead and get started with our very first clip on the steps and the method for sprouting. So here we go with the first step in the sprouting step, which is to soak. Now, um, this is just a quick and easy part. I am using here white hard winter wheat and the entire class is going to be using only this wheat. And so we're going to start the sprouting process by soaking. Now I'm going to put, oh, about six cups in here and as you can see, I'm just guessing. I like to do quite large batches of this so I don't have to completely redo it all the time. And you may also be able to tell that it's night here. It is almost 7.30 in the evening. And I always start my wheat soaking at night. So I can soak it overnight and then get a start first thing in the morning. So by the end of the day, it will have germinated enough that we can uh, proceed. So the wheat that I use is very clean. It comes to us clean. I don't need to do any rinsing ahead of time. If your wheat is not, if, if when you put water on it, you can see dirt rising or little flakes of anything, then you may want to pre-rinse it. I don't need to do that. You can also use filtered water. I'm just going to use regular tap water. So the water is just as clean as it can be. So I have no worries that I need to pre-rinse this at all. Knocking down some wheat that thinks it's going to float and I want it down in the water so that it will swell. So this will just sit right out here on the countertop all night. Good morning, it has been almost 12 hours exactly, and it does not have to be exact. I mean, you could do eight hours, you can do 15 hours, but uh, pretty much 12 hours is a, is a good round number. Um, and so you can see here that our grains have swollen quite a bit which is exactly what we wanted. We wanted these uh, very hydrated. Now we're going to pause here and talk about a couple of concepts that are really important. We are starting right now on the germinate step. That is what comes next. 
we are going to actually germinate these grains of wheat. But it may not be what you think it is, and so we need to talk about that for just a little bit. Um, the degree of germination when we are doing flour is critically important. It doesn't matter so much if we're germinating to just get long root uh, tails on them or to, to use them in salads with those root tips or throw them in soups or stews or chop them up in your food processor for doing whatever you may want to. That is entirely different than what we're doing today. Our focus for this class is on flour. And boy, oh boy, have Jim and I learned some really important things thanks primarily to hints that you all gave us when I made that video calling for help because my bread project was failing time after time. So, when we do flour, we need to be sure that we watch the germination very, very carefully. The flour that we want to produce from this batch of soaked grain has to ensure that we have a loaf that not only looks good, but the nutrition is there and the taste is good. If we let it germinate too long to where those root tips are sticking out even an eighth of an inch, the taste is going to be funky and the crumb is going to be gummy. Ask us how we know that. In fact, it's going to surprise you, many of you, when I say probably we're only going to let it germinate for maybe eight hours today, could be even less. So that is really important. Um, changes are already taking place in this grain. Uh, some people have associated the longer the root, the better the nutrition. Well, that is not necessarily true. The longer the root, the more biomass there is, but not necessarily. Well, and there may be more in terms of just the mass, but in terms of nutrition, all of the nutrition needed from a sprouted grain occurs very fast and early on, without even having to have the root emerge very much at all. So um, what is going on in there is that the enzymes that block our digestion of some of the important nutrition, those enzymes are sometimes called anti-nutrients because they block the, um, our bodies from, from um, metabolizing the nutrition that is in the grain of wheat. Those enzymes are being destroyed. Other enzymes are turning the starch into sugar, and gluten is being reduced to about half. And so all of these things are going to play into how we treat this flour, which is really important. So what we're going to watch for today is the emergence of the root, and it will be just barely, not even an eighth of an inch. In order to really understand, in order to catch it at the right time, we need to be very, very observant. And observing starts with taking a look at these grains to see what it is that we see. So using a hand lens, I am looking at these grains. Now I'm going to move over to the board and try to draw what it is that I am seeing. So what I am seeing is a grain that is engorged and it has a seam. Now, it, this is a fatter, plumper version of what we started with. Now, what we are going to be watching for occurs right down here. And what happens is this is going to split open by where this seam is, and a little bit of stuff is going to start emerging. You can right now probably even see that down here there is a little bump. But that bump right now is the same color as the bran is, the, the cuticle is on the grain of wheat. It's just kind of a bump. But pretty soon this is going to open and this little bump and right here is going to be whitish. And this is the emergence of the root. When it sprouts, it sprouts a root, and then it begins to sprout a blade. This is a monocot, a single leaf, like a grass. So it will be a blade of grass, wheat grass, it's called. So it sprouts a, a, a blade of, of wheat grass. It also sprouts a root 
the root grows down, the blade grows up, but we want to stop it before that blade appears and before that root gets any length at all. What we want to see right here is just the whitish part. When the grain gets to that point, when, when that bottom opens up and we see it almost looks like a little bit of popcorn trying to emerge, then all the nutrition that it's going to get is there. All the changes have taken place that we want to take place. And so we can stop it right then by drying it, and that's what we're going to do. By the end of the day, this will be sprouted enough. The root will start emerging enough that we can get it into the dehydrator. And that will occur somewhere between six, eight, 10 hours, maybe a little bit longer. So we need to get it going. So um, one of my goals was to develop streamlined, simple steps for doing this that can be repetitive each time that we are doing the sprouts. And I also wanted to develop something that was not so time consuming that I was tied to the kitchen all day long. And so I do my sprouting very different than most people do. I do not use jars. So I'm gonna show you what I do use. So this is going into the sink and I am moving this pan over here. It would be a very good idea for you to take your hand out and have it in front of you as we go through this so that you can make margin notes um, more fully explaining to your understanding what exactly is going on while we do this. So to simplify this step, I just used my broken strainer. It used to have long handles. This is the middle size of a three-part set, and the handles broke off, and it has turned out to be a wonderful tool. So I'm just going to scoop into this wheat, and I do want to rinse it at this point. So I'm going to just run some water over this, rinse off the soaking water, and then let it drip for just a minute. It doesn't have to be completely dry. And then I'm just gonna dump it right here on this baking sheet. So I'm gonna continue doing this until I get all of the wheat out of the bowl. All right, so here we have our soaked wheat. A little piece of straw there. Now I'm just going to equalize it out. This is the largest batch we've done, Jim. Yeah, it is. One of the reasons that I do not like to sprout um, my wheat in jars is that with a jar, there's such a mass of wheat in there. It's about three inches thick. This is about one inch thick everywhere. And it's very, very moist. And I do not need to do repetitive rinsings. Now we live in the desert. And so um, the danger for us is evaporation. If you live in a very humid area, the danger for you is going to be contamination because the water isn't evaporating. And so we need to be sure that we watch this close. I need to be sure that, that this stays hydrated and if it needs more water during the day, I will use a little spray bottle. It won't because there is a, a lot of wheat here and it's wet and I didn't drain it completely dry. There is no um, standing water on the bottom of the pan, uh, but there is a lot of moisture. Two things are needed here, um, moisture and air, while oxygen. Now what I'm going to do to help prevent evaporation is I'm just going to slip this grocery bag over one end. And another grocery bag over the other end. I want it loose. So
so that it still is getting oxygen, but it is creating a little bit of a greenhouse effect in there so that um, the moisture stays put. Then the next thing that I'm going to do is to put it out here on my uh, south facing, just in front of my south facing window. And it gets warm over there. And so the length of time that it takes for the emergence of the whitish stuff to come, off the, to come out of the tip end of each of those grains, it depends on the temperature, the degree of moisture, the rate of evaporation that you provide for it in your own kitchen or wherever else you are going to be sprouting the grain. Now because I'm putting it in a warm part of the kitchen, it's going to be about 78 degrees over there. And so we should have germination in six to eight hours. And I'm really excited to show that to you. This is the single most important step for making flour that is going to make us a good tasting loaf, a good looking loaf with a crumb that is not gummy. So here we go over to the windowsill. It's a cloudy day today, so it looks like the sun will not be streaming in. But nevertheless, this heats up as the light from the sun, even through the clouds, begins to come in through the window. All right, we have caught it at the perfect, perfect moment. We started seeing those little tips breaking through after about four hours. It has now been seven hours, and so many, many of them, a large percentage of them, have broken through. And by broken through, I mean this little button that was down here on the tip end that was the same color as the, whole, as the rest of the wheat was. They are now whitish tips, which means that that root tip is breaking through and just starting to show. So we're going to do a couple of things. You will probably find that it is difficult to see with your naked eye, which is why it is always good to have a magnifying glass around. So Jim is going to climb up on a step stool and take a, a shot of the pan as it is right now, trying to get a close up with his camera. And then just a few minutes ago, we used um, a different camera to get some real close ups, still shots, and I'm gonna put three of them in so that you can see a really good shot of what we are seeing here. So uh, Jim is going to climb the ladder now. So what I'm seeing is the uh, different grains and with that I'm able to see the tip ends move out those buttons, those white buttons, and we have better shots of this but this is as close as I can get as far as focus, maybe a little bit better focus with my lens. Here you can see, I can see these now with my naked eye now that we have pulled some out where the tip end is turning white, that little root tip is starting to push through, and so when you isolate a few on a contrasting colored plate, it is easier to see. Here are three close-up shots to give you a better view. They're enlarged so you can really see the point at which we are ready to stop the germination. The next thing now is we are going to go to step three, which is dry. Now you have a couple of options here. Some people just dry them on their countertop, but that doesn't interrupt the germination as fast as it should. We don't want these to grow any more root tip length, and so we want to interrupt it right now. And so we're going to use the dehydrator. You can also use your oven, but we need to, this grain is now, it's an inch thick and it is um, very moist, and so we want to um, spread it out on, so that we can have a thinner depth. You can do it in your oven, just set your oven for the lowest temperature possible, and then spread it out on several different um, baking sheets. These are the inserts that go in my dehydrator but I have, I have seven trays, but I only have five inserts. Here are the five little mini trays ready to go into the dehydrator. So I'll meet you over there and we'll get these started. All right, here are the last two and I'm going to leave a, an empty slot to help with air circulation.
Now, we want these to be exceptionally dried. I was only drying them about eight hours at first, and that and other complications led to a very gummy crumb. So I am now drying my wheat for 15 hours to ensure that everything is completely dry. Now, the temperature is also deemed to be critical by some people. Uh, some people say at 110, others say at 120, in order to preserve the nutrition. Well, part of that does not make sense to me because we're going to be milling this into flour, which is in turn going to be used for baked goods, which is going into an oven between 350 and 475, depending on what it is we're going to be making. And so the temperature at that point in time is going to do any destruction that a dehydrator would do, whatever degree that might be. And um, I've not found any scientific reports on how much nutrition is lost with the baking of wheat. I can't find it anywhere. So we're just going to set it for 120 for 15 hours. So it's so 122 for 15 hours. That's as close to 120 as my dehydrator will get. And I'm pulling this out all the way. So by tomorrow at this time, we will have our wheat completely dried and be ready to mill some flour and get going on the rest of the class, which will be to make some bread. So we will see you tomorrow. The dehydrator ran all night long and finished up just as we were getting up this morning. And so we have these five trays of beautifully dried sprouted wheat. Jim is going to get a close-up for you so that you can see what happens to the sprouting end of each grain once they are dried. You'll notice that it's very hard to see now, but they are there. Okay, as I move up, one of the things that we found was that yesterday you were able to actually see the white ends of the sprouts coming out of the grains. Today it's very difficult to see them and every once in a while uh, you may be able to see one. Um, I'm looking for them as I go through it and hopefully I'm not going too fast. Ah, oh, there's a whole patch right there, right in the center of the screen that we can actually see the sprouts that have dried out I have this empty container already, and it is clearly labeled as sprouted white wheat. So I'm just now going to empty these trays right into the container. Now we have plenty of sprouted wheat now for several projects. The next thing to do is, as we prepare to make our loaves of bread, we mill the grain so that it is freshly milled when we bake our bread. So that is the next step. I'm going to grain. I'm going to grind just a little bit on camera here so you can see the process. But I'll finish grinding off camera until we have enough flour that we can now begin our bread baking. So this is my Como Mio grain mill, which I just love. And um, I have it set on a very fine flour setting. So I'm just going to put some of this up in the hopper. <clears throat> and away we go. And if you're curious, this is just an extra extension. I found a pill bottle that was exactly the size of the spout that I've taped in place here to extend um, the spout a little bit so it doesn't put so much dust in the air. So let's take a look at this flower. It's very interesting. I've noticed that uh, the, the bran gets spread on the outside edges, but the other part is right here. So I just mix it together so that all parts of the... Uh, grain are mixed together with flour. This flour is beautifully fine and it smells so good. 
unlike the flour I was making when I let the sprouting get too long. So that had kind of a funky smell and then it produced a funky taste in the bread. So we're now, I'm gonna finish grinding until we get enough for our bread projects. And then the next step is to go directly into bread making. Now this is the only time I'm going to show how to mill this flour. You won't need to see that repeated every single time that I do the bread for uh, sprouted grains. So we'll be back very shortly and start our bread baking. Here is our freshly milled flour, ready to go. And I'm just gonna stir it up a little bit to make sure every part is mixed. This is whole grain sprouted flour. Before we actually start, I want to just let you know there are two tools that you really should have on hand in order to be really successful with um, bread, and particularly with bread that uses this uh, sprouted flour. One of those tools is a instant read thermometer, and it has been especially convenient to have one that has a probe on it like this. Because when I'm testing the temperature, this also acts like a toothpick that you stick in a cake, and if it comes out with some dough stuck, then the cake isn't done. The same thing happens with us because one of the big problems that we found in our many trials, uh, from which we learned a great deal. So the biggest challenge is avoiding a gummy crumb. And, oh boy, could we tell you stories about that. But in any case, this also tests to see if you still have a gummy crumb, and it helps uh, you decide when it's okay to then stop and take it out of the oven because it is done. Uh, the other tool that is just invaluable is a little scale. Now, I keep mine in a Ziploc bag to keep it clean. Just happens to be the right size for that. And, um, I do believe that this is in our Amazon store, if any of you want to just take a look at it. Um, this is as well. So those two tools are invaluable when we are working with bread. Now, the other thing is that, um, you know, I have a very nice stand mixer, many of you do as well, but we also discovered in our many trials that um, a stand mixer does not work super well for breads from our experience they get overbeaten, they get, they get um, over kneaded. And so working with a bowl and a spoon, and I just used this metal bowl and a wooden spoon, and that is so easy and it works so well as you will see. So we're gonna get right to it. Be sure that you have your hand out in front of you and are looking at the recipe. We are going to bake two loaves of bread today, plus I'm going to show you a third one. I wanted to develop a recipe that was simple and that was very versatile, that could have a number of variations. I'll tell you, Jim was so amazing on this whole process. He has a great ability to diagnose problems and to suggest uh, solutions to those problems. And what you will see today is a result of both Jim's effort and my effort to make this uh, bread um, easy and standardized so that it is so very versatile. You will notice that I have given a link uh, to King Arthur where I've started with Peter Reinhardt's recipe. I never could make it work according to how it was uh, written up on the King Arthur website. So I have made some adjustments, but I do use his basic recipe uh, with a few little tweaks. Mostly the tweaks are in the methodology, which I have found is much superior to that, to the way that it was written for whatever reason. And I can't explain it, I just don't know. But for us, it worked very, very successfully to do it the way that I'm going to show you today. One of the things to know is that when you come across a recipe and it gives the gram weight for flour, please use that weight. Measure by weight rather than volumes. This recipe states um, that it's 227 grams per the amount of flour that we are going to use for bread flour and also for um, the sprouted wheat flour. So that's the measure that we are going to do. Now here's how I do that. So what I'm using today for um, the basic recipe is half sprouted wheat flour and half King Arthur bread flour. This is high protein bread flour. 
My basic recipe, when I'm doing that loaf of bread, I'm going to be standing right here. I have the setup for that recipe here. One of the variations that we're going to do today, which is kind of a fun variation, is apricot brioche using the variation on that basic recipe. When I'm working with the apricot brioche, I'm going to be standing right here. And I've also left a little clue for to remind you that when I'm here, we're working on the apricot brioche because I'm going to be doing things simultaneously uh, in the interest of time. So let's get started. Our recipe first calls for two cups of sprouted white winter wheat flour. Also, I use the white winter wheat because there is most definitely a difference in outcome between using winter red wheat and winter white wheat. They are different wheats and the white wheat which I use in my regular baking of breads as well gives a lighter bread and a higher rise. Now I'll be using some red wheat in future recipes, not today. Everything today is going to be using the white winter wheat. So here's how I measure the flour. I put <clears throat> the bowl that I'm going to be mixing in right on my scale. And I zero it out. It is set on grams, and I'm going to then dip in here and put in uh, what the recipe calls for, which is 227 grams. Then I'm going to zero it out, and I'm going to add the same amount of white bread flour. Now we're done with the flowers, so I'm gonna put them over on this side because right now we're gonna focus on our basic recipe. So here we have our flowers. I'm gonna mix them together. And I'm going to add one teaspoon of salt and a teaspoon and a half of yeast. And I'm also going to mix this together. Now this calls also for one tablespoon of butter or ghee, or you could use oil as well. And I'm just going to use my ghee, and I'm just gonna drop that right in there. I'm just going to mix this around, and the butter is not going to get mixed in here. It's just going to get floured up a little bit. We are now ready to add the water. Now here is where you really need to use your good best judgment. Good best. <laughs> it works. Good best judgment on how much water to add. For sure, we are going to add a cup. So I'm going to go get a cup. I'm just going to dump that right in, and I'm going to go get another half cup and have it ready. With my spoon, I'm just going to stir. We need for this dough, the final dough, to be sticky and to the point where it is collecting all the flour. Well, it's not collecting all the flour. It's not coming together, so I know that I need more. Now, the recipe says to add a tablespoon at a time, and so that's really a good idea to just add one tablespoon at a time. But I know that this is going to take more than a tablespoon, so I'm going to add probably a couple of tablespoons here. Now, if you can see what I'm seeing, it still isn't readily picking up all of the flour. And I can tell that it's not going to be a sticky dough, so I want to add a little bit more water, just a little at a time. I probably have about two tablespoons left. Okay, there we go. So now you see how it's picking up easily all of the flour. Now that butter is still in there and it is not mixed in all the way. Oh yeah, this is perfect. This is very soft and it's going to be sticky. 
So we are now done with our wooden spoon. I'm gonna to toss it over in the sink. Now from here on out, we are going to handle this dough with only our hands, and we need our hands to be wet. And so I'm just gonna use a little bit of this water that I have right here to get my hand wet. And we are now um, uh, going to start doing on the back side or the second page, you will see Pam's method. This, what we're going to do next is step one of Pam's method. I call this the caterpillar. And so it is a mixing step. It is not a kneading step, although the gluten will be worked a little bit. And we need to remember that with sprouted flour, which we have plenty of in here, it's half and half. Half of the gluten is gone. So this is very much a reduced gluten batter or dough. So with my hand wet, I'm going to do a mixing motion called a caterpillar where I come across the dough and put it in little segments like a caterpillar. And then I'm going to fold the caterpillar over on itself and do it again. So here's another one. This is the second time. I'm going to do this only up to four times. So that was two. This is three. And so that butter is getting well mixed. And this is the last time that I'm going to do this. Then I'm going to turn it out on the countertop. Also use a spray oil, or generally I don't use anything because it works just fine on my countertop here. And so I'm going to pull out the dough, and my hands are starting to get a little bit sticky, so I'm just going to add a little bit of water right over here to get my hands wet. And I'm now going to do what is called the stretch and fold. Now the stretch and fold is a 15 minute process, but you only work with the dough for about the first 30 seconds. So I'm going to stretch and fold the dough for one stretch and fold it takes four times and I go north, east, south, west. And I say those out loud just so that I don't get mixed up because I need to do it four times. During this process, and you will repeat a stretch and fold four times, so it will take a full hour to do this. This is accomplishes, this one hour accomplishes two things. It begins to develop the gluten, and it also is a proofing time. The dough is going to rise a little bit at a time each time. You will notice that the dough is going to change in its consistency, in its stretchiness, its elasticity, as you work it. You're gonna be uh, sticky at first. So with my wet hand, here I'm gonna do, here's north, stretch, fold. East, stretch, fold. South, stretch, fold west, stretch, fold. Then I'm just going to fold it over into this sticky dough right here, and I'm going to put the bowl back over it. I have to do a stretch and fold four times, and I'm going to be working with two different batches at the same time. I'm going to give myself a little help. So I'm putting this little sticky strip right there that says one, two, three, four. Right now, this under here is completing the first stretch and fold. So when I come back, I'll mark out the one and then we'll move to the two. So I know that I will have done this four times. So next up, we're gonna move over here and get started on the apricot brioche. The apricot brioche starts with preparing the apricots. I have I bought these apricots, cut them into strips and then little cubes and then they have been soaking in one teaspoon of honey and two teaspoons of water mixed together as a little syrup, and that's they've been there at least an hour, so those are ready to go. Next, we're going to do the part of the recipe that follows exactly with our basic recipe, which is half and half. So I'm going to do 227 grams, turn this on, and it's zeroed out. So 227 grams of the sprouted wheat flour and 227, zeroing it out, 227 grams of our bread flour. And we are putting in the one teaspoon of salt, teaspoon and a half of yeast, and I'm just going to mix these. 
Now, here's where the deviations occur. A brioche is a very light bread. It generally has eggs, milk, butter, things like that as add-ins. So it is an enriched dough. So the enrichments are going to go in this little cup. So I'm going to be putting in right now three quarters of a cup of warm water, one egg, and two tablespoons of honey. And a fourth a cup of olive oil. I'm mixing the wet ingredients together. And now I'm going to take the apricots and just lift them into the flour. A little bit of juice can go in with our wet ingredients. And I'm just going to stir the apricots around so that they can be coated with flour. This helps them so they don't sink during the baking process. All right, now we are ready to Add the liquid and we'll be watching for the very same thing. We'll be watching for the flour to be gathered up and things turning into a ball. And I may also need to add a little bit additional liquid than what is called for in the recipe so that I can get that same sticky and soft dough. All right, as you can see, it's still a very dry mix. I'm just going to add in all of the rest of what is called for. And I'm going to grab a little bit more on standby. You need to make a judgment call for yourself as this. Now, this is not coming together like I would like for it to, even though it's picking up the flour. So I'm going to add a little bit more water. I want a sticky dough. Okay, now do we see how that's coming together now? Okay. That's exactly what we want. That was just about the right amount of water. You can add it in smaller increments than I did. Okay. Now, needing to wet my hand, and we'll do the caterpillar. We're now to the mixing part. And fold it over, and I can do this four times. I'm trying not to work the dough too much. Two, that's three, one, two, and here. Okay, so the mixing is now done. We're going to be moving to the stretch and fold. So it just went off for this one, but I'm going to get this one done real quick. So north, east, south, west. Now you'll notice this time that it's not stretchy at all. It comes apart, south, west, okay. So this is a sticky ball, and I'm going to invert the bowl over the top. And now we're coming back to this one. wet hands. Now, this is where the magic starts happening. So this is number two. North, look at this beautiful. East, 
Oh, it's gorgeous. South, and it gets harder. I'm not being able to pull it as far as I was before. West. Okay, so this one can go back. And crossing out number one. We are just moments away from the buzzer signifying that we have just um, ended another stretch and fold 15 minute segment. Now what I do is I can on my watch, I just put push repeat and so it can just, in fact, here it goes. Okay, so I'm pushing repeat. There we go. Okay, so we're going to start with this one. And you can see that it is rising. Wet hands. Now you may have noticed um, on the first one, I cheated on the time just a little bit so that I could have one buzzer signifying both. And so that worked out just fine. So here's north, look how stretchy. East, oh, it's feeling wonderful. South, and it's tightening up. West. Rolling into a ball, putting the lid back on, marking off. We just finished number two, and we are now in number three. So the same thing for this one. Need to wet my hands again. Now we should notice some difference on the stretchiness of this one. So this one is still quite sticky. North, much more stretchy. East. South, it's coming together really nicely. West, but my hands are still sticky. That should go away by the time we're done. Okay. And entering the second for this and the third for this one. So I'm repeating, getting my hand wet. And, ooh, look how gorgeous. Gorgeous, gorgeous, gorgeous. Okay, so I'm gonna degas just a little bit and do our last stretch. And it is beautiful. It's going to be ready to shape after the end of this one. And west. Okay, and here we go. This will be the last stretch and shape for it. We're on number four. This one, when we finish this one, will be on number three. See how this one is shaping up. Oh, beautifully. North, east, and it's holding together. That is fantastic. South and west. All right, we are resetting, and we're going to start on this side this time. Look how nicely that has risen. Okay. So north, ooh, wonderful stretchiness. East. South, and it's, it's getting tighter. West. All right, so this one is now going into its fourth stretch and fold. And this one is done with the stretching and folding. And we are ready to shape. So I'm going to degas and Make sure it pulls up okay from the counter because I'm going to be doing this rolling. And I always pull it just a little bit to stretch it so that it stretches across the top. I have already sprayed the pan, and this is a four and a half by eight and a half pan, getting my hands wet again. Placing it, and then 
what I do is I knock it down like this, push it so that it goes into each corner, and I'm going to cover it with a grocery bag. Now rather than saying, okay, I'm going to let this proof for 90 minutes, I don't ever go by time. I go by what the dough tells us. And so I'll be showing you what the test is to find out if it's proofed enough. And this step, it apparently, it just seems that with the sprouted flour, the proofing goes quite fast. So I'm also going to turn on the oven. Um, now, one of the things that Jim and I have discovered, regardless of what the instructions say in any recipe that we use, we are baking bread at 350 because it has to, and this was, Jim came up with this. Um, we tried because we were struggling with the crumb being gummy over and over again with our trials. So he thought if we baked at a lower temperature and it would allow the heat to penetrate and we then could cook it a little bit longer. And that seems to have worked the very best of anything that we have tried. So we are now baking these breads at 350 and I don't give a time. I don't say for 45 minutes or whatever because it depends on the internal temperature. And that varies determined by how wet the dough is. And so that is why an instant read thermometer with a probe end is so important. Generally, it takes about 45 minutes to 60 minutes for these loaves to get done. And instead of stopping it at 190, we bake them at a temperature up to close to 200, usually between 200 and 202. Um, and that gives a little bit browner crust but it also allows the, the crumb on the inside to bake off some of that moisture. So um, we will be back in 15 minutes to um, finish up this one. All right, so we're just about ready to go. It's gonna go off any single minute. So I'm just gonna go ahead and get started. So what we have to do to shape our brioche is that we need to, there it is, so. Now I just do a repeat because I like to come back every 15 minutes and check our bread that is rising as well. So I'm gonna get my hands wet so I can handle this dough better. And um, because we're going to do a special shaping on this, I'm going to weigh it. Hey Siri, what is 900 divided by five? So, I am going to need to cut this into five segments that are about 180 grams each. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to turn each of these segments into a little log. And put each of the logs in the pan. Okay, now we have our brioche shaped, so I'm just going to punch it down one last time. And we are going to cover it and allow it to rise. Now let's check our basic recipe. When it is crowned, about three quarters of an inch. So I'm lifting it up to eye level to see how above the pan it is, and that means crowning. So it has not quite crowned three quarters of an inch yet, so I'm going to leave it just a little bit longer. So this one has crowned, actually it's about an inch, and it has been proofing for 25 minutes. So let's check to see if the proofing is actually done. So I just wet my finger. I'm going to make a little poke right here. If it bounces back really fast, it is not ready. But if it slowly comes back, that means it's ready. That is a slow comeback. This is ready to go into the oven. Our brioche has crowned. It's up at least three quarters of an inch and I just did the poke test and it is ready. And so I have a little egg wash here. It's 
a beaten egg with a little bit of water added and I'm just going to coat the top with this egg wash. It will make it nice and shiny. This is going to join the other loaf in the oven and I'll be right back and we're gonna talk about a couple things. Our basic loaf still has a few more minutes to go. It has been in almost a half an hour and um, I'm not even starting to take the temperature of it yet because the color isn't right. So uh, we'll follow up and do that in just a few minutes. I want to revisit our method. Um, I didn't talk a whole lot about it. I gave you some detail, but as I was looking through um, hours of research actually on the best way to deal with the dough for flour that has been sprouted, um, the solutions were all over the map. And the methods for doing this recipe or that recipe or the other recipe, they were incredibly, I mean, there was one that had 11 steps. Another one had, the brioche recipe had 18 steps. Now, what I did with that brioche recipe, I'm not using their recipe. I'm using our basic two cup, two cup of flour, which is half and half, and then with the one teaspoon of salt, a teaspoon and a half of uh, yeast, and then a tablespoon of ghee. That's our basic, basic recipe. And so I just borrowed what they added to enrich the dough, which was the egg and the olive oil and um, honey and I, I don't have to look at the recipe to see what else. So I just decided I was going to try to simplify all of those recipes into something that is very easy to follow that we could use each time we do bread that has uh, sprouted flour in it. And so it, this has worked just beautifully. So the first part is where you mix the ingredients in a bowl and uh, by adding the exact amount of water that is required then the ball comes together and then we enter this bread method. Now I just want to make it clear I'm not going to capitalize on my method whatsoever. This is the one that works for me. If you want to tweak it around and give it your own name, please do that because this may not work perfectly for you. Certainly Peter's recipe um, did not work perfectly for me, so I did my own tweaking on it. Now the mix part then starts inside the bowl where we do the caterpillar. And so that's what this mix is, is the caterpillar. Then the stretch and fold, instead of doing a lengthy knead uh, segment in my stand mixer or whatever, we just do this simple stretch and fold times four. And it includes both the action of stretching and folding along with 15 minutes. So one stretch and fold includes the 30 second stretch and fold the dough and 15 minutes. Then the next one, stretch and fold the dough, let it rest 15 minutes, and we do that four times. Now you saw two different ways that I shaped the bread. I most often shape the bread the way that I demonstrated when we did our basic recipe. And then uh, the baking. There are particular things that you need to be aware of. I've got 15 minutes going off there. So um, I check the bread about every 15 minutes to see how it's doing, and I just did that before we started, so I'm good. Uh, with the baking of the bread, it is important to know that there is a tendency toward a gummy crumb when using sprouted flour. At least that is our experience. I don't know if it is yours or not. But in order to make sure that we have a bread that has the best chance of having a beautiful and dry enough crumb, we bake at 350 degrees and then anywhere between 30 minutes and 60 minutes. And that is a huge window, but we need to use our instant read thermometer to help guide us through that window so that we pull it out and um, the probe then can act as a toothpick as well. So we will be back when both loaves of bread are finished and out, plus I have a third loaf that I baked earlier that I want to show you as well. That is another variation. So we will be back when everything is done. The brioche is just ready to come out of the oven. It's 200 degrees right now, but I wanted to start back here and just clarify. I noticed that 
the way I had written it could have been confusing. So I, I hopefully clarified it. So one stretch and fold is when you turn the dough to the north, east, south, and west and do the stretch and fold. And then it's a plus 15 minute wait time. That's one stretch and fold and you repeat that four times. And so that total time is uh, one hour and then you're ready to shape the bread, which is next. And then in baking the bread, it's at 350 from anywhere between 30 and 60 minutes. So I'm gonna go get the brioche out. The brioche has been in about 42 minutes. So there is our brioche. Is it just gorgeous or what? And here is our, um, this came out about 30 minutes ago and this is our basic recipe. So we have these two out and we're not going to cut them for until they're completely cool. So Jim and I are now going to go run a few errands. We won't be back for about three hours. So the smell and the temptation will not get to us to the point that we get into those loaves. And when we come back, I'll put the third loaf out that I baked um, earlier, and we will go through the final results of everything that we have done. So we will see you after a while. So here is our lineup of success that we have for this class. So let's review what each of these loaves is. This is our basic half and half loaf. This is also a half and half loaf. Half of um, half the flour is bread flour and the other half is sprouted wheat flour and it's the white winter wheat. All these are white winter wheat. This one is one that I made last night. It is also a variation of our basic recipe, but instead of being half and half flour, this one is 100% sprouted flour. So that is why it is a little bit um, shorter. Anytime we do any baking with 100% whole grain flour, it is going to be a little bit heavier and doesn't have quite the rise. I'm anxious to see what the crumb is like. So that's what we're going to test right now is the crumb on each one of these. Um, when I checked the temperature on all of these, the probe end was clean, like a toothpick coming clean out of a cake. So I think we're in pretty good shape. One of the things that Jim and I also noticed with these breads is if the crumb was gummy, then there was residue on the knife, sticky gummy stuff on the knife. So let's check this one. Oh, it's beautiful. That one is just perfect. And I have tasted the, this bread before and um, it, it is just really wonderful bread. So the taste is there, the um, rise is there, the crumb is there, the nutrition is there. So let's try our brioche. <clears throat> And here is our brioche, also a beautiful crumb, not gummy whatsoever. So this is fantastic. I'm really pleased with this one as well. And here is our knife blade, so it is clean. Now here is our 100% wheat, whole wheat sprouted flour. Clean knife and also a beautiful crumb. So we have succeeded with our goal of making these beautiful loaves that um, taste good, they look good, and they have the nutrition there. So um, you now have before you the basics of how to work with sprouted flour. And now that you have the basics, you know how to sprout, and you know how to treat the um, dough because it is going to be a sticky dough, but we don't want to add any more flour to make it unsticky. Um, you have all of the information that you need to proceed forward on doing whatever you would like to do with sprouted grains. So that concludes this class, but it does not conclude what I'm going to be also doing with sprouted grains. Periodically, we will be posting another video on a different type of sprouted grain and a baked good to go along with it. And we're going to, uh, we're going, I've got some kamut out there we'll use. I have some einkorn, I have some spelt, have some other types of grain that we will also put through this same process and come back with other types of baked goods so that you will know that we're supporting you 100% on this project. 
So I hope that you found this class very useful. I hope you will put into effect some of these things. And as you try out what we've presented, let us know in the comments what your results were and how you may have tweaked it around to make your own bread method that will work with beautiful results like these are. So thank you so much for attending this class. We really do appreciate that. Spread the word. These are free classes. And so we want to get the word out so that we can share this information with as many people as possible so that we can spread the benefit far and wide. So thanks again, and we will see you soon for another class and even sooner for more videos.